Philippians chapter 1, and this is going to be verses 12 through 30 today. <coughs> I'll finish the chapter. <coughs> Here's our quiz from last week. Comes from verses 1 through 11. Uh, true or false, when Paul greets the church with grace and peace, these words don't have any special meaning. They're just like saying hello to people today and wishing them well. That's false. Uh, they're loaded with great theological meaning. Uh, grace, uh, since the time of the cross, has uh, is fully loaded. It's the unmerited favor of God toward believers where we are justified. Uh, that is given a declaration of righteousness by the Father on the basis of what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross, paying our sin debt in full. Um, by simply trusting in what he has done for us. And peace is the result of us having trusted in what Christ did for us. We are no longer enemies of God or sons of disobedience, <clears throat> but we are now um, adult sons and daughters of God. We're co-inheritors with Christ. We're sharers in the destiny of Christ. So those words are really, really loaded with great theological meaning for us. True or false, the theme of Philippians concerns the partnership in the gospel, and that's true. The uh, Philippians <clears throat> have a special relationship with Paul. They've supported Paul financially. They're prayer partners with Paul. <clears throat> They've sent a man named Epaphroditus to Paul to help him while he's in prison. Um, they've just been great supporters of Paul, and Paul is just he just rejoices in this church. They've just been a great church to work with. True or false, a key memory verse for Christians is found in Philippians 1.6. For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ. <clears throat> so this verse gives us security and assurance in our salvation from start to finish. That is justification to glorification. So this is true. Great memory verse. True or false, Paul prays for Christians in Philippi that their agape love would grow even more in real knowledge and all discernment until the day of Christ, that is, the rapture of the church. And that's true. <clears throat> He's always praying <clears throat> for these kinds of things, that uh, their knowledge <clears throat> uh, of Christ, and, and that not only would they have this knowledge, but they would be able to apply it in discernment <clears throat> so that they would... Uh, learn to live <coughs> these Christian lives in, in a difficult situation. So next question kind of answers itself, true or false. Paul was big on doctrine, but not that concerned whether Christians lived according to it. Totally false. <coughs> he wanted them to have the doctrine so that they could put it into practice and live lives that were pleasing to the Lord. So here we go, <clears throat> Philippians chapter 1, verse 12. That's where we're going to pick up today. Now I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel, so that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ, uh, the cause of is not actually in the text. Uh, the uh, interpreters, um, translators actually threw those words in there to help English readers better uh, make sense of the verse. My imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard and to everybody else, and that most of the brethren trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. <clears throat> so you have to ask yourself, I wonder why Paul says this. And you get the sense here that Paul is, is perhaps answering a concern the Philippians had about him, especially in light of their shared partnership in the sharing of the gospel. How is his imprisonment affecting the progress of the gospel? So Paul says, hey, look, my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. So rather than the Philippians thinking perhaps Paul's ministry was being cut short, Paul says something entirely contrary. It's turned out to be an advantage. Well, how so, Paul? Well, he says, look, my imprisonment in Christ, that is because of the cause of the preaching of the gospel of Christ, has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard. The Praetorian Guard is the palace guard, the palace of the emperor here. It's usually the, the praetor is usually the governor, but here in Rome, he's at the palace of the emperor. So this is the emperor's 
guard and to everyone else. <clears throat> so for two years, Paul's going to be living in this rented apartment. He has this Roman soldier, a palace guard, chained to his wrist 24 by 7. Their garrison, or where they live, their barracks, was near this place, and these guards uh, were continually hearing what this man was saying about a person named Jesus Christ. So since Paul was allowed free access to visitors, he would have the opportunity to teach about Christ to all who came to see him. The guards would hear every word he preached. Additionally, in the writing of the four letters, the prison epistles, Colossians, Ephesians, Philemon, and Philippians, he dictated his writing to his secretary, <coughs> who would then transcribe it onto parchments. And again, these Roman guards were hearing every word of those letters and the interactions between Paul and the writing secretary for points of clarification. These Roman guards heard the gospel message over and over again. Since these men by necessity would have to report what they had seen and heard while guarding the prisoner during their shift to their superiors and to those who would relieve them, and since Paul had become sort of a celebrity prisoner, he would be a topic of their conversation back in the barracks. Now we don't have any record of any of them being converted, but at a minimum the seeds of the gospel were planted. The way Paul was understanding his circumstances, rather than being the prisoner, they were the prisoners to his teaching and preaching <coughs> on the person and works of Jesus Christ. <coughs> These soldiers had gotten more teaching on Christianity than most Christians, with the exceptions of perhaps the Ephesians, where Paul had taught for five or six hours a day for over two years, <coughs> and where Timothy continued uh, the instruction that Paul had begun. As for Paul's visitors, <clears throat> he met with some of the believers in Italy before he arrived in Rome. Acts 28, 13 describes meeting with some of them at Puteoli, just south of Rome. And then once in Rome, some others came from various places. Acts 28, 15 describes that. And then once he was settled into his apartment, he called together the leading Jews of Rome. Uh, that experience is described in Acts 28, 17 through 30. He preached the gospel to them without much success, that's pretty typical. And then it says in Acts 28, 30 through 31, he welcomed all who came to him, and this was for a period of, of two years. So the Jews, as was Paul's previous experience, would almost always reject the gospel, and the Gentiles would generally accept the gospel. <clears throat> and that's really kind of what the book of Acts shows. It's a, it's a transition from the church being almost 100% Jewish at the beginning, to almost 100% Gentile at the end. Paul continued his gospel teaching and preaching in custody, as Acts 28, 31 says, with all openness unhindered. <clears throat> so this was truly a work that God was orchestrating in the circumstances that he had placed Paul in during this time. Now, one known outcome of all this is what Paul writes to the Philippians. Most of the brethren in Rome those who were already believers, he says, trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment, have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. So rather than keeping sort of a low profile in Rome as they had been doing, the Christians in Rome took courage from how Paul was handling his imprisonment, and they now began speaking out in the city of Rome. Verse 15, <coughs> some to be sure are preaching Christ even from envy and strife, but also from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition rather than from pure motives, thinking to cause me distress in my imprisonment. But now, due to Paul's imprisonment, there were local Roman Christians preaching the gospel in Rome. So Paul identified two groups um, of these people by their motives. It appears that both groups mentioned are Christians, and they are preaching Christ. Verse 18 says Paul rejoices in that both groups are doing this even though the motives of one group are seemingly out of self-ambition and the other is out of love. So the first group is now preaching, uh, out preaching Christ seemingly motivated, motivated by bringing attention to themselves. Paul had been getting all the attention. <clears throat> 
They likely believed much of the same doctrine as Paul. Maybe they were the local church authorities before Paul got to town, and now people are quoting Paul. These local leaders have a following, and they get jealous when their followers listen to anybody else. It's petty, it's small, it's therefore envious on their part, and it causes strife in the local churches. It's a bad motive. But still, <clears throat> if they're out preaching the right gospel, Paul could rejoice that Christ was being preached. <clears throat> the other group is the group that loves the truth, recognizes gifted men to the church for the purpose of building up the church. Now maybe this is what led Paul to write the section of the letter to the Ephesians in chapter 4, verses 11 through 16. And he gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the service, to the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. As a result, we're no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming, but speaking the truth in love, we are to grow in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. So they recognize Paul as an apostle, prophet, evangelist, and teacher that God has made available to them. They can learn from Paul and be built up in the defense of the gospel. They can grow as leaders and teachers by listening and learning from him. They will take their stand with him in the defense of the gospel, and Paul can rejoice in them as humble servants who are doing what they are called to do and given the glory to God. What then, verse 18 says, only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in this I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice. So how does Paul feel about these two groups? He rejoices that the name of Christ is being proclaimed. These two groups must have had the gospel right and the basic doctrines of the faith right, or Paul would call them out as false teachers, not rejoice over them preaching Christ. Paul says he will rejoice, which is Cairo, continue to be glad that the gospel is having such great success in Rome. Verse 19, for I know that this will turn out for my deliverance, through your prayers and the provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and hope, and that I will not be put to shame in anything, but that with all boldness, Christ will even now, as always, be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. <clears throat> so now Paul's going to turn his thoughts to the future. He's anticipating release from prison, whether that is by receiving his freedom or by being executed. Either way, he anticipates deliverance from this current circumstance. He knew he could count on the prayers of the Philippians and on the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Apparently, he's not receiving any indication from God, no appearances of the risen Christ as before, no prophetic words from the Spirit as to what his future held. Like us today, Paul has to simply wait and trust God's will for him. In the meantime, through prayer and the ministry of the Holy Spirit, Paul's hope and expectation is that Christ will be exalted in his body. That is, when you exalt, that means to make great, magnify, glorify, speak highly of. Whatever happens to him, he's depending on the prayers of his friends and the ministry of the Spirit to see him through what may be his most difficult test yet. He does not want to fail now and cause any shame to the name of Christ. He wants a powerful testimony to the very end, whether that is freedom or execution. Verse 21, for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. But if I am to live on in the flesh, this will mean fruitful labor for me, and I do not know which to choose. But I am hard pressed from both directions, having the desire to depart and be with Christ, for that is very much better. And yet to remain on in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. What a great understanding Paul has on this life and death issue that we all face. To live is Christ and to die is gain. Only a Christian who is so sure of salvation can speak like this. Now, he certainly has had some advantages that we have not had 
He's seen the risen Christ, Acts 9, 1 through 9. He has spent three years alone in the Arabian desert, restudying the Old Testament, having been indwelt by the Holy Spirit, being taught in light of the Lord's revelation to him, Galatians 1, 15 through 18. And he has had a visit to the third heaven, uh, 2 Corinthians 12, 1 through 6. He has been on the spiritual mountaintops for sure. But then he's also been in the valleys of suffering. There were all the tough times. Paul has suffered beatings and shipwrecks, imprisonments, hunger, cold. But Paul, but God has always delivered him. That's 2 Corinthians 11:29. He goes into that whole litany of things that have happened to him. So on the one hand, Paul's had some extraordinary revelation and inspiration and illumination. He has received spiritual gifts, including apostle, prophet, evangelist, teacher. He has had the gift of tongues, healings, and in one case, the working of a miracle of raising a young man from the dead. At this point, you would think that he could use some or all these gifts to free himself, but it appears that these gifts cannot be used like that. Even in this letter to the Philippians, he writes to their, uh, of their man Epaphroditus, who was with him in Rome, who became sick to the point of death. But he says, but God had mercy on him. Well, why didn't Paul just heal him? It appears the early gifts needed to validate Paul's message and him as the messenger were no longer needed. And so Paul, just like any of us today, must depend on the mercy of God to heal a person. Certainly, if he had been able to heal some people or raise some important people from the dead, the Romans would have freed him on the spot and put him in the palace with servants rather than keep him under guard. On the other hand, he has suffered greatly for the opportunity to preach Christ to the Gentiles. <clears throat> That's what the Lord told Ananias to tell Paul in Acts 9.15. The Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen servant of mine, to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. <clears throat> so the Lord set a course for Paul that included suffering for his name. Just as Paul had made Christians suffer for the name of Christ, <clears throat> now the Lord would make Paul suffer for his name. Of course he would rather be in a glorified body with Christ, but yet if Christ wants him to remain here, suffer some more, continue preaching the gospel to the Gentiles, he would certainly obey God's will for him. That is a faith to live by. It's a faith that won't disappoint you. It's a faith that puts you right in the middle of God's will, and there's not a better, safer, more desirable place than that. Verse 25, convinced of this, I know that I'm going to remain and continue with you uh, all your progress and joy in the faith, so that your proud confidence in me may abound in Christ Jesus through my coming to you again. So now it seems, though, he's... Uh, thought through the evidence against him, has come to his own conclusion that he's going to be released. Paul's kind of an optimist in that way. He knows the Roman legal system very well. If Caesar really had an interest in this case, why put it off for two years? Now, according to the writings of the early church fathers, <clears throat> it was Nero who released Paul from this first imprisonment in about 62 AD. They said Paul likely went back through Macedonia, probably to Philippi. He also likely met up with Titus and got the churches started in Crete. He would write the letters of Titus and 1 Timothy during this time of release. But then Nero's going to rearrest Paul and have him executed in 68 AD. Paul's last epistle, 2 Timothy, would be written from a Roman dungeon just prior to his execution. Verse 27. Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel, so that whether I come uh, and see you or remain absent, I will hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, in no way ashamed, alarmed by your opponents, which is a sign of destruction for them, but of salvation for you, and that too from God. Paul's going to exhort them as what they need to do spiritually. Conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. This word conduct is very interesting. It is polite uomai, which means to live as a citizen, conduct one's life or live in relation to others. 
uh, here it really has the idea of being a citizen. This would have been a particular word of interest or importance to the Philippians because they lived in a Roman colony. Citizenship and public duty was very important to everybody who lived in the city. So here he is saying that they are to live as citizens worthy of the gospel. That is, they are to demonstrate a public manner of life reflecting their duty to the body of Christ and to its head, to whom they are responsible. This is the life set apart to God. Now, our responsibility to human government is outlined in Romans 13. The Philippians would have had access to that instruction through Paul directly or from a copy of the letter uh, to the Romans. The church is not a nation, but nations are a divine institution with the church having members in every nation. So to live worthy of the gospel is to live with the Lord Jesus always as our head and to live within the laws of whichever country we are in to the extent that we are not forced to choose disobedience to Christ. Our loyalty is always to Christ. And if we have to disobey the law of the nation we live in to obey Christ, we then accept the fact that we will face whatever punishment the law prescribes. Civil disobedience has its illustrations in the book of Daniel with the examples of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in not bowing down to the statue of Nebuchadnezzar and then of Daniel himself continuing to pray to Yahweh in direct violation of the order not to pray to any god or man other than the king of Babylon for 30 days. So how are the Philippians to do this? How are we to do this? They and we are to stand firm in one spirit. And this is the uniting like a team with one goal in mind, striving for the faith in the gospel. Striving is an athletic term, so Paul gives them the idea of being like a team of athletes operating as a team against an opponent. He says of their opponent, don't be alarmed by them, just stand firm together in faith, hold your ground. This is the same idea as is found in Ephesians 6, 10 through 18, where we are told to put on the full armor of God. We're not out conquering new ground. Christ has already won that battle. We're simply to hold the ground by standing firm in the faith, having already put on his armor. These adversaries, adversaries are the enemies of the gospel, pagan Greek idolaters. In our day, the enemy calls itself by different names, but their goal is still the same. Verse 29, <clears throat> For to you it has been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake, experiencing the same conflict which you saw in me and now here to be in me. So all believers have received a gracious gift from God. We have the gift of salvation by grace through faith, but we also uh, we are also to view suffering for his sake as a gift. It's the gift of suffering that God the Father applied to his own son, Hebrews 2.10, and he will use it with us to bring glory to his son, 1 Peter 1.6. In this you greatly rejoice, <clears throat> even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, so that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. We don't always know the exact reason for our suffering, but assuming we're Christians and it's not something we've brought on ourselves by our own choices, such as bad life, lifestyle choices, we will likely suffer physically, socially, mentally, uh, and suffer attacks from various schemes of the devil and his demons. And this is why we have to be armored up in the armor of God uh, that he has provided us every day so that we can stand firm and hold the ground, resist the devil in his schemes, and defend as a team of believers. And that is what Paul was encouraging the Philippians to do, despite the circumstances, and it applies to us today. Some applications. Paul's imprisonment is a great example of how God orchestrates the progress of the gospel, even in situations where it seems very unlikely that the gospel could have any progress. Our situations today can be used exactly the same way for his glory. Having a spiritually mature understanding of living and dying like Paul had comes with a faith that has been properly built up and tested. This is what Paul was talking about in Colossians 1.28. We proclaim him, 
admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom so that we may present every man complete in Christ. That comes by a steady diet of learning sound doctrine over time. If you're not getting that, you're not getting built up, you're not going to uh, have these kinds of understandings of life and death and confidence uh, when it comes that time. Living as a citizen of the body of Christ within a nation is what Paul exhorts us to do. And this means our first loyalty is to Christ as our head and to his body. We live loyally within the laws of our nation to the extent that this loyalty and these laws do not conflict with our first loyalty and the law of Christ. In the United States, we're citizens of a constitutional republic, a form of democracy where 100% of all eligible citizens have the right to vote for representatives to make our laws and amend our constitution if needed. When our national citizenship rights are exhausted and there remains a clear conflict between the nation, state, and our head, the body, we are to exercise civil disobedience as a last resort and then face the civil penalties. So that's Philippians chapter 1. We'll get into chapter 2 next week. Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. See you next week.